your boy Scandi, the Hip Hop Original, and we're back for the second half of season two of the um, acclaimed Head to Head interview series. And this is episode number six. And I've been joined by simply one of the most amazing um, voices of the UK hip hop scene. And um, it is definitely an honor to finally get a chance to sit down and and, and conversate with him. So without further ado, let me um, welcome to the Head to Head series, the one and only Tommy Evans. How you doing, sir? Good to see you, man. I'm good. Pleasure's yeah. mine. How you doing? Yeah, man. Good, good, man. Keeping well. Had a decent Christmas, okay. you know. Definitely up for nice, getting nice. back in the game, man. <laughs> so, yeah. You know this, man. That's what I'm saying, man. And I know we got a lot to, to get through tonight, man. And I know it's been a very, sure, sure. very productive 2021 for you. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to kick this off with the first question we usually ask. Um, so, Mr. Tommy Evans, how did you find yourself in hip hop? How did I find myself in hip hop? So I hail from a very creative family. So one could argue that my entry into the world of hip hop predated my arrival on planet Earth. So my auntie is a very successful artist from Portugal. She specialized in tapestry. She's exhibited around the world. Her husband, my uncle is also an artist. Their son, my cousin is an architect. He was running an architectural firm in Brazil. He's now back in Portugal. On my mom's side of the family, again, although they weren't necessarily artists, people were very appreciative of creativity. So it could be argued it's something that I was socialized into an appreciation of the arts, culture, language. In my house, my mom had books lining the wall. I was actually just up there now. And I was actually a visual artist first before a musician. So my first degree was in visual communication, which is a euphemism for graphic design. I started out in fine art, but when I discovered the joys of Photoshop and Illustrator, that meant I didn't have to get my hands dirty with paint. I transitioned into the world of digital art. So those visual skills are something that I still use to this day with my releases. But in terms of actual music, I was always into rap since I was a kid, there was never another genre that had a sway over my heart. It was hip hop from day one. My mom had a very big collection of records at home and she, she had all these stories of her own youth in terms of the artists she'd seen and met. So for instance, she saw Ike and Tina Turner in a Roman amphitheater in France. She saw Stevie Wonder when he was little Stevie Wonder. She saw Bob Marley. She actually met the Rolling Stones. That was the first concert she ever went to. She met Jimi Hendrix. Her friends were the support band in Chester, I believe the show was. And they hooked it up so she could go back to meet Jimi. And he was there in his caravan backstage with ladies doing his hair and nails and clouds of smoke. And sort of uttering, yeah. So she still has his autograph to this day, which she got valued by Sotheby's. So it's worth something. And she even had a signed Shabba Ranks album which I have no idea how she got hold of that. <laughs> and even as before her giving me a, a, an Ice Cube album that she'd got via a work colleague. So you could blame my mom <laughs> <laughs> for steering me in that path in the best possible sense, not that we'd ever attribute blame to our mom, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think it's something that was just uh, maybe destined for uh, conditioned in the best possible way to appreciate an arts, culture, language, imaginative expression. Yeah, nice man. So, so what was the the, the element of um, hip hop culture that really that you would say that you graduate um, that you gravitated towards first? Okay, good question. So, to begin with, it was more break dancing. It wasn't that serious. I did do graffiti for quite a while and that linked into my whole passion for the visual arts, for design and painting. I actually did uh, a couple of meals actually with uh, a graffiti writer called Insta. Sorry, Insta. Mm -hmm. His Instagram is called Instagram. <laughs> so that was the Freudian <laughs> slip there. Mm -hmm. So we actually went to school 
school together. His sister was in my class, actually, so that's how I knew him. Mm. Um, never really did any DJing or anything, but I basically got into rapping by accident. So I recall being a hip hop night and yeah, I had some friends who rapped and said, oh yeah, you should go on the mic and spit something. And I did. And just seeing people's responses made me think, all right, I could do this. And the nature of my personality is that I'm a very diligent, dedicated, hardworking person. So if I put my mind to something, I will achieve it. Obviously I have many other flaws as a human being, not to blow my own trumpet too, too much, but I have a very, very strong work ethic. So approach rap and rapping with a very serious attitude. It was never really something I thought, oh, this is just a hobby thing. I want to play rap. It's like, no, I want to do this properly. So I approached it with commitment from day one, really. Right, right. And and what part of the, the, the UK was this at the time when you when you first picked up? Good question. Pen? So the part of the UK which I picked up the pen in was the part of the UK I've just come from now. <laughs> so I'm in London at the moment, but I was just up in Leeds last night and right. today visiting family. So I'm from Leeds originally. Mm -hmm. And Leeds very beautiful city. It's the greenest city in Europe, apparently. But it's very different to London. And at the time, it was very different to London in terms of rap. There wasn't a big culture of hip-hop that was very underground at the time. There weren't many people rapping. In fact, I didn't meet any rappers, per se, until I left high school, which wow. was some mad you know, in 2021. But there really, like, there really weren't any rap kids that were rapping at school. There were quite a few kids who were into rap, mm. but there were no kids who were rapping. Like say, the only person who I really knew who was doing something that as part of hip hop culture was Insa in terms of graffiti. And there was another guy, Steady, who um, was into DJing as well. He later ran a record label called Boom Bad Professionals. But there weren't really many people, but it was through those guys that I met a crew of uh, rappers and I'm like, wow, MCs, <laughs> this is amazing. Something that right. had been an abstraction, what, watching MTV raps and it being an art form that was still predominantly across the pond in America. Yeah. And you'd have to, I mean, I didn't have Sky TV either. So I had to get friends to stay up late to record it or go around to like my cousin's house to, to record it, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So there was something special and sacred and almost mysterious about rap music at the time because it wasn't as mainstream as it is now, if you see what I mean. And yeah. especially being in West Yorkshire as well. So I think in many ways that instilled in me that hunger and desire from doing a psychoanalysis on myself and reflecting to take it very seriously because it wasn't just something you took for granted. You had to exert yourself, even just to access the music and to yeah. find out what was going on. Whereas now, and I'm not one of these sentimental individuals, nostalgic for the past by any means, whereas now it is so easy to access. Yeah. And I find that a very beautiful thing. But as a kid, that wasn't the case as much as it is now. Right. So I think that's what set me on my trajectory uh, as an aspirant rapper from Leeds. Wow. So so for a period of time, you would say you were the, the only rapper from Leeds? I wouldn't say I was the only rapper, but I was one of a handful of rappers that I was aware of in the social circles I moved in. So maybe there were a lot more, but it's just there wasn't that much going on. And I think yeah. as well, I, not to sidestep, just to step back momentarily. The beautiful thing about London is that as a global city of seven to 10 million inhabitants, depending if we're looking at in a or collective conurbation, right. it allows subcultures to not only exist, but to thrive and flourish. Mm. So whatever you are into in terms of your particular subculture, you can find it in London. Whereas if you live in Bognor Regis, or Bath, or I'm trying to Taunton, 
or Churro or Sunderland, it's probably a little bit because it's just a smaller population. So statistically speaking, there will be less people who are yeah. into this particular passion, be it cosplay, be it train spotting, be it stamp collecting, be it mm. being a goth, whatever you're into. So yeah. it allows to uh, thrive and flourish. And Leeds is a big city. It's the third biggest city in the UK. Right. But it isn't on the scale of London on that front. And at the time, there just weren't as many rappers. So it just so happened that there was more towards the end of my formal school education that I started meeting people as passionate about hip hop culture as I was, because I've been pretty much in my own little world on that front prior to that. So, yeah. Right. So, so in the early days of uh, when you was rapping, who would you say were like your, your early UK influences? There weren't any UK influences. And that's so different to 2021. Again, this will probably be 2022 now when we broadcast this. Um, it's funny, actually, again, just to go on a little tangent, I did a um, show slash presentation at the Bradford Literature Festival a couple of years ago. And it was in this beautiful theatre. And my whole show, you could call it, was that Shakespeare is the greatest rapper of all time. Did you know that Shakespeare invented the word swagger? Really? That's a I never knew that. <laughs> yeah, so Shakespeare invented swag. Yeah, deep, isn't it? <laughs> so I was coming at more from a linguistic analyst rather than saying, literally speaking, Shakespeare is bars. But what was interesting in my show that I was doing my presentation I was going through a list of, in my personal estimation, who the greatest rappers of all time were. And it was very American and male-centered. And obviously I had a certain amount of reflective and saying, you know, that's probably going to be different as the years go by with globalization, as you know, time develops and stuff. So I put forth to the audience, which was a young audience, who they thought their greatest rappers were. And it's fascinating because they're all saying British artists. Yeah. I was like, that's so deep because that wouldn't have been the response probably even 10 or 15 it's certainly not 20 years ago um and certainly not when i was a kid so for me growing up my biggest influence would have been the far side yeah so if you listen to the track ophelia for instance which is a track that i'm probably well known for mm -hmm. if you listen to my delivery and as an expand, just compare it to how I'm rapping now, it's a fascinating thing, but that's a, a tangent again. Mm. It's a quite a high-pitched delivery, but in the flow and the cadence, quite similar, consciously or unconsciously, to Amani from Farside. That's who I sort of mo modelled my style for. By that point, I found like, my own style, but it wasn't finely tuned. I was still building up my studio experience. But when I first, first, first started rapping, Farside, all the way, and... If we are going to mention British rappers, the only British rapper I really listened to at that point was Black Twang. And for me, still, he, the, that particular crop generation scene that we're from, he, for me, is still the greatest on that front. But obviously, there's so many artists you could name, it's not to take away from anyone. Um, yeah. So, yeah, he was someone who was coming with very explicit British references that were immediate and within our UK cultural capital. But in terms of the sound, I would say, far side. Um, also, I'm very much into, you know, for me, my my favorite hip hop era would probably be the Soul Quarians movement. Mm. So the likes of Common, who I've performed with, and if you saw my recent Instagram post, I bumped into him again <laughs> yeah. uh, about six weeks ago. So that was an interesting conversation I had with him. Um, most Def. Uh, Talib Kweli, although I'm not condone his recent harassment of women online, which is quite disturbing, but just as an artist, loved him. The Roots, D'Angelo, Erica Badu. Mad actually, I connected with uh, one of um, Erica Badu's producers recently. And again, I think that's a phenomenon of the age ring, global, uh, globalization, social media. There's a space time compression that occurs. So it's now feasible that you could come into direct contact with someone who's on the other side of the world, whereas again, as a kid, that's just 
not happening. Even in, like I'm saying, in Leeds, there wasn't that much going on. Now the whole world is at your fingertips in an instant. So definitely, Soul Quarians movement, uh, Native Tongues, Tranquil Quest, De La Soul, Jungle Brothers, Queen Latifah, just a very soulful hip hop sound. And I think that's probably evident in what I make to this day. That's how I would define my style, soulful rap. I would say someone like Children of Zeus, a soul with rap. And I'd say I do soulful rap, if you see my okay. distinction. Nice, Big up Children man. of Zeus are incredible. <laughs> dope, 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 man. All right, so so in terms of, um, let's, 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 let's go with the, the, the main thing, like the, the name. Um, what made you decide to yes. just settle with Tommy Evans of all names? I couldn't think of a cool rap name. <laughs> That's basically it. Mm -hmm. Never, you know, I, I, I didn't have like a nickname or anything like that. So I, I did try and think of names, but it just didn't feel authentic and true to myself. Mm. So I'm like, yeah. And in many ways, it was quite a bold, audacious move for the time because people didn't really use their own names. The only other person in the UK at the time would be Lewis Parker, um, who again is a, a you know, a, coming up in the end that was someone who I was mesmerized by his production um and fortunately got to work with him as well whereas again now it's a bit different the rappers using the real names to whether it's like Jack Harlow um Dave East etc um but also actually being privy to what rappers real names are so you know in the classic sort of Hip hop era, you would there was an air of mystery about it still. Whereas now yeah. with Wikipedia, yeah, you can find out all the facts. <laughs> so yeah. um yeah, it's funny, man. Uh, so that in a way, having your government name removes an air of mystique about yeah. who you are. However, a lot of people would ask me, oh, is that your real name? Yeah. I, or is that a name that you've you know made up? Is it like from like a gangster, like Tommy Evans? He's like some like mafioso yeah. gang, uh, gangster dude. I like, nah, that's my name. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I just rolled with it. Yeah. I remember um, uh, an interview we did with uh, DJ Vadim told us a story about mm. when he went to um, tour in Australia, and obviously they yeah, yeah. when you go through customs and they declare um, you you can't actually say he couldn't say I'm I'm there on holiday because obviously his name's on the poster. So obviously yeah, once you, you're there, yeah, you know, yeah. it kind, kind of affects you when you don't have a stage name. So uh, yeah, yeah, man, yeah, I can yeah. see it can be a pain either way, man, especially when you're a, a performer yeah, as well, yeah. man. So so when you got to the stage of, um, um, talk us through when you got to the stage of releasing your first single and, and how you got yeah, to that, that sure. moment when you were like, you know what, I'm now at a professional level of doing this? Yeah, I always approached releasing rap music with a serious disposition. It was something I was very passionate about and committed to. So I actually used um, money that should have been going for my <laughs> degree. And I saved it and uh, spent it on recording and releasing my first EP. <laughs> um, so, just uh, an organic process, but I would say, I think I was doing my internship in the public eye. So I had very little studio experience at that point, but because I was very diligent and committed and serious, what was recorded was released. So a lot of my early releases I wouldn't say they're demos because there's a, as you say, there's a professionalism about how we approached it and put them out, but it's definitely a work in progress. You can discern the journey and how we've grown over time. So yeah, it was just something that I wanted to do. And the hunger, I guess, came from the fact that I was in Leeds and I could see that the epicenter of hip hop culture in the UK was in London and I wanted to be a part of that and putting out music and doing things on a serious level was my way of getting my foot in the door 
and trying to transition into that more ambitious arena, shall we say. Right, okay. So one of the great, all-time great UK hip-hop labels is um, y &R. and And um, mm. so t tell us about your your involvement in helping to get that off the ground and, and how that began. Yeah, sure. I mean, y and I was Jess' baby and it was something I came to a little later because he was from Huddersfield and there were a couple other guys he, were, he was making music with who were also from Huddersfield and Halifax. So that was more like a Huddersfield Halifax thing. I was from Leeds. And I saw his commitment to craft, his seriousness at a young age in terms of releasing music and it being him being dedicated in a way that I didn't see many people I knew of in Leeds in the same way. And that's not to put anyone down, but just in terms of that absolute commitment to getting the music out there. So it was sort of a natural fit to align myself with that movement. And yeah, it was a group effort, uh, team effort, everyone very working very hard, um, getting the music out there. And I think it coalesced further when we all moved to London as well. So that just meant we're now in the hub where the hip hop culture is taking place in the UK. And it meant there's, you know, you know that saying your network is your net worth. So yeah. it just meant that you've got that social capital, you've got those connections to bring things to fruition in a way that was less feasible up north. But you're still trying to just get your name out there by putting the records out. So, yeah, definitely, man, it was uh, integral to the journey. Yeah, and I and I and I, um, I distinctly remember. I think I met you a few times around that time as well. I was around no, the time. No way, of, really. Yeah, yeah, around the time of you know Deal uh, Real Kung Fu. Fantastic. You know all all of the original like when there was like a real buzz in the UK hip hop scene, man. And and you guys were everywhere mm. like at the time. You know, and obviously yeah, you mentioned yeah, yeah. Ophelia was like getting spins like on a lot of the hip hop shows at the time as well, and was definitely sure, sure. a favorite, you know, that people really were into, man. Um, so yeah. I guess the next step really was um, the, the debut project, was it The Turbulent Times of Tommy Evans? Yeah, so let me rewind actually, because I'm just going to okay. add a couple of my opinions or insights into that era because i reflect upon this a lot so the kung fu hfm um msm music triumvirate as you could call it which is all sort of north london based the energy then was so special and like i said yeah. i'm not a nostalgic guy but i do think it was a moment in time or history that i question could ever be replicated again just as aficionados of grime will look back at say 2003, 2005, very fondly look at the radio sets, the raves, etc., mm. and how different it is to nowadays. And like I say, it doesn't mean that one time period was better than another. It's just a natural thing. Culture is a verb, not a noun. So it's not static. It's constantly evolving, reproducing itself. And what was different about that era to now, I think, is that so much more of the creativity was taking place in the real world. So, as I mentioned, you had Kung Fu as like the main event of the scene. MSM, Mr. Bongo, Deal Real, record stores that were pushing it in a physical sense. Um, and then HFM, the soundtrack via the airwaves. Uh, you might be developing your craft by the radio sets, live shows, freestyles, on the street corners it may be, battling other MCs. Like, I went to Philadelphia even around that time. Um, you know, I was battling American rappers out there, and recording out there. Got love from um, Jazzy Fat Nasties, who are part of the Roots sort of extended family. And Diggable Planets performed at Black Days, which is this classic, iconic neo-soul night. Um, What's different to now is that internship, the terminology I've used, which may be a bit corporate, but it'll suffice for the moment. 
So nowadays I would see younger artists perform the internship within the matrix. It's pretty much all online. So you're curating your online avatar via social media, your media presence from facing public company to the world within your socials, Instagram, TikTok, etc. putting out videos on YouTube or via platforms, Grime Daily, etc. um and networking with artists often within that realm. And one of the things I've noticed that maybe was an advantage in the kung fu days was that it meant we could develop our live craft in a way that I think is perhaps harder for artists now. So often I'll see younger artists performing live and their stage shows are less finely tuned because a lot of the creative expression is within the digital realm. And even I've seen like larger name artists um who I may maybe less polished on that front. But of course it's something that develops over time and you know you can see the apex of that is Stormzy whose live shows are mind blowingly incredible. In fact I'll put it out there Jay-Z is my all-time favorite rapper. I think Stormzy's Glastonbury set is better than Jay-Z. Oh yeah. Definitely. And Stormzy yeah. showed me love as well in, in in person. That was one of my career highlights as well getting love from Stormzy but we'll come to all that stuff later. Um <laughs> so yeah, Kung Fu days definitely a very special moment in time where there's a unique energy for the scene especially because rap music just wasn't in the mainstream as a british phenomenon at the time so it was again maybe a little bit more precious and something you had to seek out and maybe there was an exclusivity to it hopefully not an unhealthy exclusivity um but it was just something that we truly cherished because it wasn't easy to get hold of Ophelia and this will link to turbulent times so thank you for indulging my lengthy uh journey here again reflective of the times yes Ophelia was a much loved tune and i think one reason why is that there weren't many rappers doing love songs at the time and for me to be out there Tommy Evans government name doing a tune about romantic heartbreak that's sort of maybe set me apart um but interestingly enough that I had so many people like a show that said ah oh, do you not think it's a bit commercial do you not think you're selling out and I'd just be like what <laughs> like but again it was probably just a very different mindset at the time to link that now to turbulent times turbulent times was never an album that's actually a compilation of previously released singles so although i appreciate that it was seen as an album uh the intent was that it was not an album it was merely just a collection of songs and even the sequence of it was the chrono- chronological order and there were even some remix- remixes there so would then really use that as a full representation of whereas at the time as an artist it was more just a documentation of the two or three years up to that point that had been releasing music professionally and just getting it all on a CD because again you have to think at that time it was all vinyl and the irony yeah. was I didn't even have a record player so I could even listen <laughs> to my own tunes so it was a, a you know a boon for me to be able to play on CD now like it's funny I had my my Spotify rap up and my most listened to artist was myself <laughs> which is probably a very very a very Kanye West sort of thing to say <laughs> with probably kindred spirits on that front but um so it was myself and then a singer called Shaolin who's from Virginia in the USA she's a protege of Pusha T so check her out big up Shaolin man she's dope had a combo with her about squid games not so long ago <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah turbulent times again I think something as well that set that apart so you mentioned my using my government name uh emotionally vulnerable songs about relationships which were just non-existent in the UK the artwork of that record uh photographed by Gavin Watson who's a legendary photographer uh he's yeah. an OG older gentleman uh yeah. he's very well known for his work documenting the skinhead and punk movements so when i say skinhead we're not meaning like the the right wing nazi bigoted yeah. racist we're talking more about the punk sort of lifestyle um and yeah he's an iconic photographer he's actually had you know his i've seen his work exhibited in um uh, the B&A the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton he had uh, an exhibition around the time of 
This is England. I hope I said the name of the film right. Shane Meadows yeah. film from 2007. And he's a, an official photographer for Doc Martens. He's done some stuff with Plan B as well. So um, even I saw the other day, Paul Young, the 80s pop star. So yeah. he did that uh, the album uh, artwork. And again, I think what set that apart was that it was fun. And yeah. I'm going to draw a connection between that time period and now. There's probably a lot of quite taking ourselves seriously at the time. Yeah. Um, so that artwork is a lot of fun. And I've got a big up Spy Matt, who is the um, graph artist from Halifax, mm. who designed the cereal box. And those are actually yeah. real cereal boxes we designed as well. So yeah. big up Spy, <laughs> Spy Matt. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. So I was having this convo the other day um, about videos in the UK at the, at the moment. And I was saying, you're not going to get something like, I don't know if you saw Drake's recent video, video with Future. Um, right. And basically, uh, where he's covering that right said Fred tune. But he pokes a lot of fun. He can, Drake can laugh at it. I mean, Drake is one of my favorite rappers, right? He's like in my top three rappers of all time, right? Um, he is able to laugh at himself. And I think maybe that plays a large part in his success in the... He doesn't take himself too seriously and that's quite disarming and charming and people find an yeah. affinity in that. If you think about it, there's not many rappers still from the UK visibly having fun in terms of being open with a sense of humor. Everyone's got yeah. a sense of humor, obviously, and will joke privately or have fun when they're performing. But having that sort of self-awareness and um, self-deprecating irony and love, it says, Still haven't really seen it that much in the UK, to be honest. Um, mm. And I think maybe there's a maturity element as well. It's still, as a mainstream, popular, financially successful offer, he's still relatively young. So I think maybe as people become more established and comfortable in themselves, then they could, you know, satirize themselves and poke a bit of fun at themselves. But So I think, yeah, that also set that particular project apart um, in the, yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> clearly having fun on the cover so yeah yeah it was a lot of it was definitely a lot of character man but then but then also when you came with your official debut um the new year's revolution yeah, yeah. that was almost like yeah. a a complete contrast was that was that by design yeah, I or? Think by design i am a designer after all <laughs> yeah and i worked with a very sick designer on it who also happened to be a member of the i think it was a um, former Yugoslavian royal family as well, which I only found out retrospectively when I saw his photo in Vanity Fair on yeah. Europe's royalty. Um, he, he also did the first Foreign Beggars um, album cover as well, Big Up Foreign Beggars. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's funny because when I was in Leeds yesterday, I was just uh, um, the studio of one of the, the first artists I came into the game with Big Up Moncton. And yeah, he pulled out that album. I was like, oh my God. Like it's so hardcore the artwork. If you've got the vinyl and you open up, like the the the, the image is very iconic. That was actually the, the the second photo we shot that day and it ended up being the cover. Um, also by Gavin as well. Um, but um, yeah, if you look at the interior artwork, <laughs> it's very very militant. I won't say anything further lest I get myself into trouble. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? We're all products of our socialization and you know our, our environment and how we've been raised. So you know, I had a particular political disposition at the time. And mm. on one level, I'd say it's very, very easy to talk that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, walking the walk is the eternal challenge of the lifelong project of trying to be your fully realized apex of humanity. So there's no way I would ever produce the artwork like that now. However, it captures a moment in time. And I actually had a lot of fun on the shoot. And you know, there's a whole bunch of great artists that came through there. If you look at the interior art artwork from Diablo of Terra Firma, he's on there. Um, who else came through? Uh, Len, who I did my EP recently with. Um, so yeah, a whole, a whole bunch of that. Uh, Biscuit, who's a flute player, was there. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. Uh, CY was there, um, Noella who sang on some of the tracks. So yeah, um, 
but it was just a way of me getting out some of my political concerns at the time. But what's funny is the album I did after that, which was never released, um, the one that Mr. Thing produced, the Odyssey, was sort of like a shift back in between the two sort of ends of the spectrum. So it's a bit more of like a spiritual, soulful affair. And that was really the first time I felt I'd nailed the sound I, I was after. So like I say, you know, my whole set of influences were the Native Tongues movement and Soul Quarian. So when right. I did that album with Mr. Thing, I was working in a way that I finally wanted because, you know, one of the deep things in those days was even just making music was an arduous task and I would say needlessly challenging. But again, it was just the circumstances of the time. So even getting into the studio would be a nightmare. And there'd be like two year gaps between songs being recorded and released. And at the time, I'd be like, why? Why should it be this hard? But again, you're dealing with a lot of younger artists. Infrastructure wasn't developed. There wasn't really any proper mentoring. Um, we, we were all learning on the job. So there's nothing I would exchange from that time period for now in terms of the actual process of recording and releasing music. It's just so much easier. So that album I did with Mr. Thing, that was the first time that I could make music on the terms, my own terms. So one right. producer. If you notice all the albums I put out, we say it's always one producer per album. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. just logistically, it makes things so much easier. You have a cohesive sound. You have a you know a holistic body of work. Um, and I was working a lot with singers on it, and that's something that you see increasingly in my work as well. But we can discuss that more in a bit in terms of my yeah, soulful yeah. rap sounds. So yeah, that was um, sort of like the the journey in those days. Yeah, and was that was that project supposed to come out on Y and R or? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure looking back now. My memory is a bit big. It was just something I was working on at the time. Then obviously I took a, an extended hiatus from the music industry, not from creativity though. And yeah. I think this is been advantageous for me in terms of becoming a more rounded artist. So as a younger artist, obviously I'm still very young now, but it's just like rap, 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 hip hop, hip hop, yeah, hip hop. Yeah. The journey I've taken, you know, I've done a whole bunch of work in the world of design. Can I, can I ask you one quick short film? Can I ask you, yeah, can I ask yeah, you one, sure. one quick question before before we um we speak about the the hiatus. Um, on a New Year's Revolution, you had a feature from Nana Cherry. Was did you to seek her out, or oh, how did that work? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's my auntie right there, man. I love yeah. Nina Cherry so much. Um, yeah, not biologically, but just in the spiritual sense, my auntie. Man. No, she sought me out. So oh, wow. I was actually in Portugal. Yeah, I was in Portugal. I come back from Portugal. I left my father, I was like, just staying with my cousin. And the first thing I checked my answer machine messages, and it's like, hi, this is Nina Cherry. And I'm like, nah, this is a prank, man. <laughs> She's like, I got, you, I got your record awesome all this sort of stuff come around like come meet up come to my house let's connect let's get creative all this sort of stuff and like that's literally she left her message like on the first day i got into portugal and then it's like hi it's nana again <laughs> i'm like no i'm getting like, nana cherry so yeah like i um call and um yeah connected with her so her partner is cameron mcveigh who is a legend in the british music scene and has worked with everyone from Sugar Babes, he did the first album. He did, um, well, him and Nena actually, they executive produced Massive Attack's first album. Um, he, who else has he worked with? He did Nena's stuff. Um, he's done stuff with Tom Jones, Duran Duran, whole bunch of people, Stereo MCs. So there was a project that he was working on at the time called Virgin Souls. So originally I was doing some vocals for them on that project and you know i did a whole bunch of shows with them around europe and everything um which are just yeah crazy adventures you know just staying in like like five star hotels and like nato and everything like and the crew um like doing like i remember we did some like mad shows in like switzerland like a like a ski festival there so i was hanging out like like the swiss version of girls allowed and everything so it's just <laughs> Yeah, bonus. I mean, I have got a lot, a lot of unconditional love for those guys because I cannot begin to state how much 
they have looked after me over the years and um, were so compassionate and caring and took me under the under the wing you know like 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 as a family you know i mean it went beyond music man um introduced me to Andy Oliver who you know legend in British broadcasting as well um met Makita Oliver through them um so yeah a lot of range my best story i'm going to do a quote you know when Kanye did that drink trance he was like i'm going to do a lot of name drops this is my uh, preamble of warning now so my best celebrity encounter I've, i've got a lot of celebrity <laughs> encounters uh to the point where at times i'm like oh yeah yeah i'm a <laughs> Like the other day I was going past this Paul Smith shop and I was like, oh yeah, I met Paul Smith and he like complimented me on my dress sense, but that's another story. So one time I was with Nana right in Camden and we were going to pick up Mabel, right? There's a pop yeah. star in our right, but this was when Mabel was younger, right? Mm. And we are um, we were outside of Pam this like disheveled elderly gentleman comes our way. Oh, how are you doing there? He had like long curly hair, not too dissimilar to mine, but much longer and a slightly more uh you know gray and uh you know uh weathered features and um she's like oh hi how are you doing rob all this like, yeah, i'm doing good and um he'd come out of the boozer right so i'm thinking oh like, he must be a musician because of you know yeah. the, the company we're keeping and i nearly said to him i'm so glad that and he said to him, oh right are you, are you the singer at the pub like you were playing the band there <laughs> And then at one point he's like, oh yeah, yeah, just doing some stuff with like Portishead's drummer. So I'm thinking, oh, I mean, I love Portishead, right? I mean, all right, this guy's serious. And the whole time I'm looking at him thinking, this dude looks mad familiar. Anyway, like we're leaving, and I like, see you later, Robert stuff. She's like, you know who that is, right? I say, like, yeah, I think she's like, yeah, it's Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin. I'm like, no, man. So yeah, I met Robert Plant when Nana Cherry got to pick up Mabel. So yeah, I had to tell my mum straight away that was uh that's crazy but yeah Nina Church she really looked after me man her and her husband the whole fam and um yeah so with the track on that album the story behind that was that was one of the last tracks we did for that album. We'd, like it's so mad as well. we've gone through so much actually trying to get the track recorded some mad like crazy things that went down there it's just literally like even one time we had her at the studio it just all uh, like yeah but yeah basically recorded it and stuff and um yeah it's on the project there's also a song i recorded with martina topley bird who appeared on tricky's albums she's been a singer for massive attack she was on common's album as well um so i'm glad you brought that up because i was sort of fast forwarding my whole vision was always beyond just doing hip hop and battle rhymes and sort of london centric rap if you listen to the turbulent times you can sort of see you know tracks like not nice for instance i was very much on doing sort of like water torture there is that sort of battle rap element but again as i found my feet and knowing who i am i'm like you know i'm a mellow sort of guy you know i mean not really an eggy dude so the whole soulful sound is really what i wanted to do and i wanted to work with singers and i didn't just want it to be rapping and bars and uh, just that sort of uh, esoteric lyricism so i had a vision beyond and trying to collaborate with musicians uh, not just rappers and those outside of the hip hop culture so yeah um so that was all good that that you and Nina we actually did a mad video for it with, like this animated like this puppet spider thing the track i did with martina we couldn't get clearance from her label um so Yeah, it's the suspicion distance has passed since the event so it's not going to be bait yeah. me saying this, but she was like she was like bootleg it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, so yeah, big up Martina man, like really happy to see her release the music again as well. She had a long hiatus, so welcome back Martina man. I was really uh, really happy for her. Like it was great great seeing her new release. So yeah, that was that was just one of many career highlights um at the time um So yeah, hiatus. Um, mm-hmm. It was a hiatus from hip hop, but it was a hiatus from creativity. So in that so time, was it I a said, case that you just I've... woke up one day and just thought, "Nah, I'm done with this"? Or no, you mentioned the shelf garbage. To be honest, bro, it's a long story, and it's not a story that I'm necessarily going to go to in a public platform right now. There may come a time where I do share it in a bit more detail publicly, but 
it so happened that I, I made a very sudden, unanticipated departure from hip hop that I hadn't even anticipated myself. Um, but it didn't mean I wasn't being creative. And because I come from a creative background before making music, I'm always going to be creative regardless. So I did a lot of the, the YNR covers as well, the artwork. So that was something I was still doing, my graphic design, and it's something that I still do today. I design all of my artwork, I do all my own video edits. Um, I did a lot in terms of spoken word, um, a lot in terms of videos, touring, um, even just performing. I, I, remember I did like played in like Malaysia, like three separate occasions, like art festivals out there, beautiful country, amazing people. Um, short film as well, acting, directing, editing, um, and me being the uh, ambitious person now, I did a PhD and wrote a book at the same time. So I was literally writing my PhD thesis and my book, which was a poetry collection, simultaneously going back and forth between the two. So I got my PhD in 2018, put out my nice. book in 2018, and um yeah so there was never any moment where i was not being creative it's just i i didn't happen to be in the hip-hop arena but again it might seem like odd but if you look at it there's so many artists throughout history who have had extended hires even we mentioned nina cherry she had a i'm trying to do the years now i think it was a gap of almost 14 15 years between her third and fourth albums Mm -hmm. um, if you look at D'Angelo, there we go. The gap between his second and third album was about 15 years. Um, so, it, you know, it does happen. Uh, the, the author, I believe, I don't want to get it wrong. I believe, it was, no, I don't want to say. There's a famous author who wrote a very iconic book and then she didn't write another book for 25 years. So it does happen for whatever reason. Um, so, so during so that yeah, time, you um, had during that time there was um, was it? I would just say was it? Um, did you create like a um, a character by the name of um, Tommy A Man Evans, or was that just um, when uh, you do your spoken was, word pieces? That was just so. Yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was for a short while. But again, it's like almost embracing the concept of. And anonymity and like your foreground in the art first and foremost but yeah I just dispensed with it and went the thing is everyone's always known me as so I said it's sort of a bit late in your career to have a, a name shift so yeah I've just stuck with Tommy Evans and yeah that served its purpose very well it's who I am so yeah but it's good to be back and 2019 was when I released my comeback album and that was based on the poetry collection that I released in 2018. So about half of that album was informed by pieces in the poetry collection that then adapted. And, you know, when you're writing poetry, there are different styles of poetry, but um, mine was always informed by multi-syllable rap schemes. But then obviously I'm not beholden to a beat and the timing required. So it did mean I'd have to edit words out, but as I always say, you know, art is an editorial process, whether you're designing a record cover, putting together a film, writing a book, composing a song. It's less about what you put in, but what you take out. Just as when you're writing a PhD thesis, one thing my supervisor said to me is provide warrant. How can you justify this quote or this piece of data or this interview that you've included in your writing? So the same thing. Um, so it was a great editorial process taking words that had been written in my head that could work over a beat, but were then arranged on a page to then go back and revisit them and repurpose them for songs. So that album was produced by DJ Agent M, who was the first producer I ever worked with, actually. So it was a beautiful uh, full circle for me. Full I was actually with him last night. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so that was, that was the, so that was like 2018. I'd, um, I was doing some, I was working on um, some some TV work up north actually, and yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. I hollered at like uh, DJ, and I was like, yeah, I should do a couple of tunes. And this is always the case with me. I like starts off as a couple of tunes, it turns into a piano. Ah, let's do an album. So yeah, yeah. 
just been, nice. um, been yeah been back since 2019 and just uh really enjoying it as ever so, so let me ask you a quick question about the book man so the book is um mm. titled medusa wore a weed or in yes. the absence of magic now yes. what was the inspiration for that title yeah fantastic question so i'm really fascinated by technology in the natural world by truth and falsehood illusion and reality and when writing that piece there's actually a line in the poem where i mentioned medusa war we and i felt there was an articulation of these dichotomies or seeming opposites what's true what's false what's real what's illusory so it's really just a very powerful Uh, suggestive of that concept and then obviously you have the subheading or in the absence of magic as well so you know I think in this day and age where we're so interconnected you have space-time compression globalization technology becoming more and more a part of our lives the rise of AI etc how it all intertwines with our lived everyday experiences. I was really exploring that within the poem through different forms of imagery and that title and the subheading for it really encapsulated it for me. And I was fortunate to work with a couple of really incredible artists on the visuals for the book. Mm. Um, so Azara Amoy, who is an illustrator, uh, she does a lot of murals. Um, I first encountered her work about two years earlier in Brixton. She'd done a mural that I'd seen whilst I was attending the show by Last Poet. And I was like, this girl's artwork is amazing. And then, as is the case, find people via social media, connect with them, build a bond, etc. So I was like, yeah, I want her to do the artwork for the cover because she has like these collage designs where she mixes different media and again in her artwork there's a lot of this juxtaposition of technology the human form certain motifs reoccur so if you look on the artwork of the book and on my comeback album anti fragile mm -hmm. there are certain things that appear on both such as the snake which is a link to medusa right um microphones the the black mirror with the flame in it um so yeah she did the artwork and then the interior design was done by incredible um visionary called abby wright um who's also an artist curator designer so it was like a i don't just look at it as a poetry collection i see it as like a visual piece as well so we spent like a year just working on the visuals to it never mind my writing and with the artwork, I really just want to encapsulate some of the themes within. So again, taking it back to that idea of producer, what I was trying to communicate with that image as well is the very thing that you fear the most isn't real. So your greatest fear can be overcome when you confront it. So in Greek mythology, Medusa is this very terrifying Gorgon. Um, and obviously the, the hero slays her and has to use her, his shield as guidance because if you look in the eyes it turns you to stone so there's all these elements of mythology technology etc that were sort of encapsulated in the title and the subheading in the absence of magic so in this day and age of technology um some of the mysteries and mythologies of life are removed but then we also find substitutes and alternatives and my humble estimation as a social scientist is that that's one function of conspiracy theories they provide a grand overarching narrative of a cosmic battle of good and evil that it can explain some of the randomness and confusion of everyday life that bewilders people and can give a meaning and purpose to events that might seem very distressing or unsettling. So yeah, that's quite a long uh, answer to your question. It's funny actually, because I've, I've not had to talk about the book for a while because it's been like three yeah. years now. I'm just going on muscle memory. <laughs> what I can remember you know, from when I wrote it. Yeah, and I think one of the um, and I, and I'm glad you mentioned that it, um, a lot of that 
the book was incorporated into the album as well, man. Because when you look mm. at the book now, mm. you know, it, it, it kind of gives you almost like, especially the way you, you constructed it, it looks like you're, 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 you're formulating the songs and it kind of gives you a bit of behind the scenes almost into yeah. how, and it's something yeah. that's very, very rare. And we'd love to see more artists do it. You know, I'd love to see like the Ryan oh, kind of totally. Drake and how he first formulated these, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, the yeah, songs yeah, yeah. and how they come together. Yeah, yeah. So so to me, yeah. in a sense, it was a bit groundbreaking in that sense, you know, because that's something I definitely Thank love you, to bro. see Thank more you. artists do, you know? And yeah, um, sure, sure, sure. I tell you um, who did a good thing on that front that maybe was inspiration was decoded by Jay-Z. Have you read yes. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That but like, it, he, he kind of did it backwards though. He kind of did it. He done this record where you kind of done it, and yeah, then the yeah, album yeah, came. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I loved it though because you had stories in there. You had the yeah. imagery because obviously he loves his art and stuff, and you had photos, but also beautiful illustrations. You also had the footnotes to the songs, and then like the narratives and the stories behind it. So it was great. So for me, the book was a cross between Jay Z's Decoded and um, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, which is a poem that I studied as a kid. And because it was so esoteric in its frame of references, and he actually employed what I would describe as a literary precursor to sampling. So he would quote a lot of classical texts in his book, but the way he embedded it into his writing was very left field. So his publisher demanded he include notes to explain his writing. And even the notes required additional notes from like, um, yeah. later commentators so for me it was sort of following in that tradition I would say Akala as well is one of those rare artists who has also um, published writing um, that complements his music but in a way his just goes beyond that because obviously he's such an uh, incredible thinker and philosopher and political commentator it's not just a case of his artistic expression it's also his social commentary so um, but I guess it all feeds back into each other. So yeah, right. big Carla, man, another West London legend. So, 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 what would you say is the um, the origin of the title? Why, why did you choose to call it Anti Fragile? Um, that is a homage to a book of the same name by Nassim Nicholas Talib. So, actually, all my album titles from my second uh, existence as a musician, they're all pretty much quotes from other places. So I love the concept of anti-fragility. So Nasser Nicholas Talib is a philosopher, academic, um, economist, former stockbroker, an absolute um, genius whose ideas per page quota is off the scale. He's also known for his Black Swan book, which predicted the stock market crash of 2008 before it happened. He's got another book called Skin in the Game, which has become a maxim or a, you know, a well-used phrase. So I, I was introduced to his work by Malcolm Gladwell, not that I personally know Malcolm Gladwell, but love Gladwell's writing as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I just took it from there. Um, and just this concept of you know resilience, robustness, a survivor's instinct. So really it was just a reference to that, but trying to articulate it in a cool fashion. Um, and as I said, the album was produced by DJ Agent M um, mm -hmm. and that was my comeback album. Had some dope guests on their face soul sings on yeah. there. He just put out his uh, album this year, Yusra. I think he's gonna be very big. Uh, he did something um, uh, for Colors recently as well. So yeah, that was an honor having him on there. Um, yeah, it was it was a dope project. There's quite a lot of spoken word artists on there as well, actually, which I suppose because I've been in that scene. Mm. There's quite a lot of people who've, who I've been collaborating with in that world. So. Um, people like Lola O, Oviyuki, who are on there, they're all um, wordsmiths, but from that scene, first and foremost. But yeah, it was great to be back making music. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's a particular term which I think was officially coined this year by um, the rapper called West Side Gun, um, where he calls himself a hip hop curator. And um, and he wow. means that in a way that it's kind of like what Dr. Dre does. He just knows how to bring artists yeah, yeah. together for the for the the greater cause and um and i, and I know sure. obviously we're gonna we'll talk about this as we, we discuss your next three projects after this um but one thing I, I i noticed about you which you do very well is you manage to source artists like a lot of artists obscure artists that are very unfamiliar to the uk hip-hop scene and you manage to yeah, bring yeah. them together 
you know is that something that you intentionally um do because i know you don't usually oh, yeah. go for the the usual suspects you you draw like new names yeah. new, new artists yeah, yeah. The scene. bro bro you, you've done your research very well <laughs> um i've always tried to be supportive of other creators i've always had commitment to a community of artists in whatever discipline or genre we're working in and you know for me if one person went we all win and i like to see people do well genuinely um and it's always been my pleasure to try and introduce new artists to the world interestingly enough again last night when i was back in leeds i uh, connected with double d dagger who i think they had some stuff out on why enough um after i was in my you know during my hiatus but danger and deep busy the incredible rappers and uh, producers um yeah so it's nice connecting with them as more you know as more mature artists now and um you know something i've always tried to do like bring through creatives so there's definitely a purposeful intent with that also there's a practicality to it bro in the generally speaking what i found is that younger artists tend to be hungrier and more humble and I'm at a stage of life where time is precious, one's well-being is precious, the people you spend time with is precious. So I want to work with people who I get on with. I want to have a rapport with people first before I even get in the studio with with them. Um case in point anti fragile produced by someone who had done effectively since my childhood, right? Um so just having your ear to the ground knowing what's going on seeing who the up and coming artists are seeing who's got that hunger and eagerness to create and not necessarily caught up in the inevitable politics which you can find in any industry you know I've, I've operated and traversed in many industries so it's not just a music industry thing it's there in the design world it's there in academia which took me completely by surprise maybe I was a bit naive on that front but the way some scholars go back and forth with passive aggressive papers critiquing their theories is not too dissimilar to rappers battling and it's through language as well there you go so yeah there is a practical element of it but it's not in a machiavellian strategic oh i can take advantage of these young artists because they're more malleable and will therefore do what i want never that in that anyone that's worked with me knows you know that's not how i conduct myself or try and behave with the utmost ethics and integrity you know when working with other artists and i get excited bro when i find new creators um i love it it brings me joy i want to see them do well and if there's a way that i can support other artists then i'll always give back and i don't expect anything in return i'm not doing it in a i scratch my back yeah <laughs> how do you say you scratch my back i scratch yours um so sort of way i'm not expecting uh reciprocation i'm doing it because of my commitment to the craft for my love of the art form for my desire to contribute to community to build the culture to hone our skills as creatives so yeah it's just been an absolute delight um seeing some of the artists with me just source of face soul i've known him again as a teenager in fact i've performed with him in malaysia when he was a teenager so to see where he's at now putting out his debut album this year and uh, doing some really good streams on that and again recognition you know you know uh, in Europe has been great uh, another artist I want to uh, you know really praise and a uh, shout out loads of Svetlana um she's a neo soul singer um british nigerian uh young lady from london and it's mad I was just speaking that she's in nigeria at the moment and I was actually at my dad's house and I was there like in the front room I'm like wow that sounds like Svetlana and like literally they were listening to her I was like no that's what I had to remember. I was like you're not going to believe this and they're like my dad and stepmom are listening to you right now so I was like she like, oh, it's made my day so yeah just seeing her doing so well on her journey and stuff and just so many of the other like I mean you'll notice bro I work a lot with singers I work with singers a lot more than I work with rappers and so I always get a real buzz when I work new singers just on Monday recorded for the first time with a singer called Doella. She's incredible man like came through literally nailed it in one take. And often you know, although I'm not a singer myself I 
can't really sing, but I know how to hold a note. But I'm very clear in my head when I work with singers what I would like them to do. So I do a lot of coaching on vocal performance, especially in terms of right. I want you to hit this note, do this layer, etc. Do these runs. Um, but in Doella's case, it's just bang, one take main vocal, bang, one take ad libs. That was it. <laughs> so right. and then again, it's editorial. I'm like, right, I want to use that bit where you're doing those runs, that bit where you hit that note there. So for me, that's one of the most exciting things about being an artist is creative collaboration and working with young up and coming artists and not just um, in the studio, but providing, I guess, the mentorship and pastoral support and holistic care plan, right? It's not too formal that we didn't get when we were yeah. coming up in the game. And not to be like a bitter old man about it, because I think I've even heard Riza from Wu-Tang saying that even him, a legend in the game when he was coming up, didn't really get that sort of level of support that they probably deserve. So whether it's just, you know, giving on advice or just sending messages of encouragement or being like a shoulder to cry on or, you know, sharing um, resources, you know, um, one of the things that I've always done is, you know, share resources like a database of DJs, influencers, bloggers. Some people get very territorial and protective of that information mm. um but yeah i share <laughs> i share it man yeah. and i think bro one of the things i've found is that i'm fortunate i've been around up and coming artists i've been around underground artists credible artists i've been around pop stars bro i've been around very famous people like big names and seeing them have a level of humility like you know bro i met prince harry you know what i mean and the dude was humble sincere softly spoken supportive of the community i'm from so i'm from west london lab grove right that's my adopted toe so i'm five minutes from grenfell so him and his partner have done so much support for the community in fact big up mega Markle, right she did so much stuff for our community but it was never even publicized so people can run their mouths in the press critiquing her we know she's sincere. We know she's got a kind heart. We know she's compassionate. We know she cares. We know she's got the backs of people from working class you know, communities. You know what I mean? Um, so having seen that, you know, that just encourages me. Or hearing, for instance, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts where I study a lot of um, you know, podcasts on like economics and business. Um, Masters of Scale is one that I check out with Reid Hoffman, who is the um, founder of LinkedIn. And even just hearing, you know, like the, the owner of um, Airbnb talking about during the pandemic, how they had to reorganize their operation. But again, they approached it with ethics and integrity. We're not going to lay off people without ensuring we support them to find new jobs or retrain them or create a database where they could get in touch with other professionals. So my whole attitude is, well, if people at the top level can be this way, then really, you know, someone, no, I have to, you know, I'm an underground artist, I'm not a mainstream artist. Um, I have to conduct myself with integrity when it comes to working with other creatives. So, yeah, that's how I try and do it. And that's my way of giving back to supporting up and coming artists. But there's so many, bro, just, you know, run through the credits of my, the, the four albums I've put out since 2021 pretty much all the featured acts are all young up and coming artists man so it's been an absolute joy um working with them so yeah that's brilliant man and um i was very fortunate to be present um at um someone that shared a similar philosophy to you as well um mm -hmm. the late great ty who brought you who brought you on board yeah. for your comeback gig which i which i later learned <laughs> was your comeback gig at the past the tour that's correct event. yeah and um yeah so, do you want to say a little bit about that? Like, officially coming back to the live scene? Well, first of all, rest in peace, Ty. Um, God bless Ty. Our thoughts and prayers and goodwill always to his family. I had the honour of meeting his mum in the summer um, and his sister. So, that was very, very humbling, meeting his family. Um, and it, do you know what, bro? It's really deep. I was having this conversation with uh buddies of mine leaves us so when i was away from the hip-hop scene there's a number of years i didn't see anyone at all and it's not like by design i was like it's beef or anything like that it's just as is the nature of human relationships often 
the utilitarian and transactional, not that I personally go into that intent, but it's just the way of the world, unfortunately. I wish it would be different. And I, like I say, me trying to be the person that gives back is my way of countering that. But I didn't see anyone in the hip hop scene for years. And then it was like literally 2013, bumped into my guy, Wayne Wonder, not the dancehall artist, but uh, UK hip hop uh, legend, Wayne Wonder. And that opened the door for just connect with a bunch of other people. And so a few years later, after I started bumping into people on the regular now, I bumped into Ty at Kensington High Street tube station. <laughs> just completely random. Um, and so, yeah, just exchanged details with him and then um, bumped into him again, like, like a couple of months later uh, at Meccan, which doubles as my office. That's uh, a legendary Malaysian restaurant. In, um, I bumped into Lily Allen there once as well. Um, I said, I'd be ashamed of the name dropping, right? <laughs> um, I did the, 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 the second time I met AJ Tracy was there in the Bay was, we got AJ Tracy there in Level Grove Legend. Um, so, yeah, I just bumped into him a, a few times and stuff. And yeah, it was deep. I think one of the things that crystallized, I think, and I hope I'm not, you know, because I don't want to be that person that inserts myself into his narrative. You know what I mean? Sometimes people will be very opportunistic when someone passes away and then they make it about them. But I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, there was always a mutual respect, even though we didn't know each other that well. During my first tenure of the hip hop scene, um, I got to know him a lot better in my comeback, which is really deep, bro, in the last few years that he was alive. Um, and so uh, a very dear brother of mine is Mike Assassin, who, you know, is again, someone who I worked with from literally like the age he was like 17. And so we did so many shows together and stuff and like obviously he's smashing it in terms of his business now and being an entrepreneur and he's done a few few rap tunes as well. But I think, you know, he yeah, he, you know, very graciously and generously said a lot of nice things about me when he was doing an interview with Ty. And uh, I think from there, you know, as fate happened to have it, you know, whether you believe in that or not, um, it just meant our paths were crossing a lot more and that mutual respect and admiration built even more. And yeah, I think one of the times that we, yeah, we just had a deep combo was uh, on the Killer Keller podcast, Big Up Keller. And yeah, he just said, he's like, it's good to have you back, bro. And I was like, coming from you, that means a lot, man. That means, because he is a legend in the game. And I remember, so I know I'm talking at length about Ty, but I think it's the fitting, bro. Like, you know, the whole giving people their flowers, let's keep giving him his flowers. I remember a show I did around the time of his Upwards album. And you know, I was saying to you how Black Tang is like my all time favorite UK hip hop legend of an MC. Upwards is my all time favorite UK hip hop album. And I think it, got, it transcends beyond that. And that's always what one of the things I've been trying to do with my collaboration with other musicians. I think Ty was always about that in terms of he always had that very musical ethos. It wasn't just rap, it went beyond that. Especially his working with singers, uh, he worked with. Tony Allen, who was fellow Cootie's drummer, right? So he had that vision beyond it, just not being like a rap or a hip hop thing, that musical sensibility. And I remember doing a show and just like, Ty was there and I was very honored. I just stopped the show and I said like, you know, support this guy. Like, this is, like his album is the best album ever at the UK. Um, so yeah, it was just, it meant a lot that my first show back was via Ty and you know, him booking me, man. So that was, um, yeah, it was humbling, bro. Yeah, it meant a lot. And even he was like, <laughs> you know, when he was introducing me, uh, you know, he praised like, the song I put out. You know what I mean, bro? I'm probably going on a little bit now. It is a little bit emotional for me, but it is, it's all from the heart, man. It, it genuinely meant a lot. And um, then, like, he was saying, yeah, this guy's been sampled by Dilla as well. So, you know, it's just funny, man, just how all our paths cross and, you know, the, the six degrees of separation often turn into one degree when it comes to music and creativity. So, yeah, God bless Ty. Rest in peace, Ty. And, you know, we, we, we love you. You know, we love your family. You know, I hope um, his legacy will always be appreciated and that, you know, younger musicians are inspired by his example, man. So, big up, Ty, always. For real, man. 100%, man. Definitely well said. Um so you followed the album, um, the comeback album with the 
Synchronicity EP. Um, our guy yeah, produced by yeah, Len. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friend of yours. Yeah, my guy Len, man. He's like one of the nicest dudes you'll meet. And again, he was someone who always had that vision beyond hip hop. So he's produced for everyone from the likes of Spragger Benz, the dancehall artist, Jess, Terra Firma. Um, so he's someone who I'd worked with a lot during my first iteration in the music game. He was actually someone who I'd still stayed in touch with even during my time away from hip hop. And also he'd sort of veered away from the hip hop scene and he's, you know, he's an incredible musician, bro. Like he's like, uh, uh, plays bass guitar. He's got a band called Cro-Magnon. Um, and also he's an engineer at Sony. So doing like engineering terms, of like film soundtracks and everything. So it was deep. That was sort of his re-entry as well, back into doing like beats for like rappers from the UK and whatnot. So that was a beautiful thing, and we're fortunate. <laughs> um, yeah, recorded quite a lot of that. Actually, I'll be. <laughs> you know how I was saying earlier about Martina Topley, where there's a sufficient time lag that I could say, I'll I'll stay silent and listen. But yeah, we recorded the bulk of that together. Then the um, lockdown hit, so I recorded the final track for that with Nutty P. It was again, it's just oh, an incredible man. musician. Uh, rapper, singer, guitarist, mm-hmm. actor and director, if you see his latest film. So yeah, that was beautiful recording that. And um, yeah, again, got to work with some incredible guest teacher who's an incredible rapper and singer. Um, one of the people who I enjoyed the most working with was Jada David, who you'll see all over my my, my recent stuff. Um, so with Jada, I knew her cousin for years. And I knew her from the spoken word scene, but she raps a bit as well. Her voice is amazing. Um, so I was saying to her, like, I'm going to get you on tune. So that was like the first time she'd pretty much been in the studio. Uh, she, yeah, she's just an amazing artist, man. Just so emotionally honest. And um, her way with words is just so articulate. Um, nice. So yeah, I worked with Johnny Pitts, who's a legendary broadcaster, author of the incredible book Afropean I just encourage everyone yeah. to read it um, yeah. now I was fortunate enough again that's one of the things I admitted when I was talking about my time away from the rap scene I was writing for Afropean like interviewing a lot of people for Afropean um, that's an incredible project man it's a big up Johnny and again it's deep as well like he um, I forgot <laughs> it's so funny you meet so many people then people remind so I actually met him uh, around the time that uh, we released Move Now with Mark B, rest in peace, Mark B. And um, him and who was it? It was, uh, oh, was it Harvey from So Solid interviewed me for a TV program. And they'd had like Amy Winehouse on there, I think Kanye West, like, a, like you know, early on in the career. So that was mad. But um, yeah, I should say as well, Move Now, I got love from Kylie Minogue for that song. She said it was sexy. Wow. So uh, that's, that's one of my career highlights, like being sampled by Dilla, yeah. performing alongside Common, getting Lover in the Flesh from Stormzy, Kylie saying my song was sexy, I can retire now. <laughs> There's a point actually where um, I think like, do you know what bro, actually like, she did a remix of it as well. This has never been made, I've, This no one's heard this story, right? Yeah. So I was out in the music game at this point. Mark B sent me a remix that she'd done with some rapper. And like, it was whack. <laughs> um, and there was even talk of going on tour with her. But I was just out of the music game at that point. So yeah, that's wow. a bit of a mad one. But yeah, rest in peace, Mark B, man. So, uh, did, so did the record ever come uh, out or was it? Or did it the come remix out? didn't. The uh, remix didn't. I, I don't know what came of that, to be honest. And I was just so <laughs> not in the music headspace at the time that I wasn't like now. I'm like, bro, that's mad. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. She was even singing. I think they like demoed it, so it's like a rapper doing it on it. And then I think she was meant to drop her vocals in on it, but then uh, it never got released. Basically. Um, so yeah, that's a mad one. Like, so there you go. You, you got you got the exclusive story there. Got the exclusive <laughs> right there, man. Man, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so we come yeah, to, um, yeah. so um, how how was lockdown for you, man? Was you very productive artistically during that time or? Hell yeah, hell yeah. yeah. And I want to tread very carefully when I say this because I realized lockdown was a very challenging period for many, many people. So now I don't want to come across as like indulgent, narcissistic, belittling other struggles. Like, oh yeah, for me it was nothing. 
um, I've recorded a lot of albums. I'm not going to say the exact number because, you know, sometimes it's best not to say too much publicly. You know how it is, bro. You know, you keep certain things to yourself and then you let your artist yeah. speak to yourself. But since my return to the music game, I've recorded a lot of projects, which is how I've been able to release free this year. That's not the sole amount of albums I've recorded. I'm not going to say the amount, but anyway, there's lots more music to come. Um, but yeah, just I was fortunate in that I found really optimal working methods during that time. So I found a new studio, new producer who I've recorded with, an album with uh, that isn't out yet. Um, and so just having that regular space in which to record, nice studio, chill out, mellow, that, mellow you know, engineer, professional working habit. And then it just made it easy in a way that, as I've said, it wasn't you know, when we're in our original iteration in the classic UK hip hop golden days. So yeah, it's been a productive time period for me and hopefully the body of work that I put out there, the catalog speaks for itself on that front. Um, you know, obviously this day and age, you can't just let the music do the talking. You know, it would be very naive to think that will suffice in the crowded ecosystem that is the social media matrix so you do obviously have to play the game by its rules but obviously try and do so in a way that's consistent with your values and your authenticity as a human being and in a way that's congruent with your well-being so that you're not on social media for you know ridiculous amount of hours of the day that it becomes detrimental to your health so balance yeah. is key balance that's in the way to children and zoos <laughs> <laughs> so so what what is it that um inspires you at this stage in your career man to to be so yeah, prolific yeah, yeah. do you know what um i had a conversation with rick flow of jungle brown last night actually asking me for pretty much the same thing and um i've never no I, I don't recall a time in my life where i haven't been motivated so even my entry into the world of making music it was always with the intent of doing this profession it wasn't just like a little hobby or joke thing i've always just been very driven determined self-starter a lot of self-belief and it's interesting bro i'll use another sort of name drop but there's utility and purpose to it so i'm buddies with a musician called cool t who is an incredible r&b singer and he was part of the legendary 90s iconic and groundbreaking black british r&b group emanate and obviously they were working in a time period that the precedes when i was making music and obviously when i started making music it's different now so hearing his stories and the challenges that he went through as a black british musician at a time where you know the charts were just dominated by boy bands or you know very corny pop music and you know rap and r&b even from America weren't that big in the British charts, never mind it being from British musicians. And hearing his stories of like, you know, like like having tunes remixed by Diddy or opening up for Janet Jackson. He's done stuff like Madonna as well, just like crazy, crazy big names. And he's on his own independent journey at the moment. And I'm like, bro, like you're hunger and humility considering the scale of your accomplishments like you know like having a tune remixed by Diddy that's big you know what I mean like opening up for Janet Jackson that's insane that you have like that level of hunger and humility that you know you're playing these smaller venues more intimate spaces you could easily be like do you know who I am like uh, this is beneath me like so again it's just that lesson I was saying like just seeing having that model of artists or people just in other frames of endeavor where you know the authentic honest individuals of integrity so there's no excuse not to sort of conduct yourself in that manner um so yeah like it's just i'm as hungry as ever in you know, during my time away from music the hunger was articulated in other art forms i'm back mm -hmm. doing rap music and uh as hungry as ever and determined to just to get the music out there, put something positive and uplifting out there without it being preachy at the same time, um, having a bit of fun with it, laughing at myself a little bit and trying to bring through dub artists as well and just make some beautiful soulful music that hopefully people will, you know, will listen to 10, 20, 50 years time. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, enjoying the, enjoying the process. For me, 
Steve, I had a friend say to me at first, I'd say, oh, what's your angle? I was like, this is the angle already. Just for me, it's such a blessing to mm. be able to create and articulate myself expressively, live my dream. And if you'd said to me when I started that you would end up working with this artist, even just like certain British artists who I looked up to, or even, you know, right, like, you know, I've had, you know, I've had love from Easy Mo B, the only producer to work with both Biggie and Tupac. I've had love from Malice, obviously, you know, from the legendary uh, clips, you know what I mean? You know, so to get, you know, uh, love from, you know, people I looked up to young or seeing the next generation, like say I had Stormzy come up to me to show me love in person. You know, I had love from like Dave. You know I mean, I've had love from Loyal Kana. You know, I used to see the next generation. Or, you know, artists in different, you know, I've had love from Getz, you know what I mean? So, was, you know, a lyricist of that caliber. Show me like, so for me, I'm very comfortable in myself in terms of knowing my ability levels. I'm not in like, hopefully in an arrogant sense, but just in, you know, having that comfortable, quiet, calm confidence in my ability level. No, just the, the love I get from other artists has been um, just so beautiful on that front. Um, and um, yeah, just, I just love what I do. <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's the love, as most have said, man, you, know, you do it for love, you know what I mean? That's amazing. Uh, yeah, man. I can't articulate it any better than that. Man. So would you say it was by just, just to um to, to to touch on these projects um quickly, would you would you say it was by design that you, you decided to release three albums in a six month span or because I I don't oh, yeah, think definitely. it's been done yet in this country in a UK hip hop scene from a hip hop artist as Do far you know as what? I'm aware. I'm gonna give uh Yay and they Genesis Elijah just put out his third album of the year today and he's releasing you, more tunes than I but well, you did it in six yeah, months so, though right but July to December I, that's six months yeah that's correct however Genesis Elijah's released a song every week I haven't done that so <laughs> I, like he's taken <laughs> that's my brother I love Genesis Elijah so much and he's someone who I think it has evolved so much and it's just got mm. better and better and better and better. And there's one, and this is no disrespect to anyone from the scene. I'd never disrespect any of the artists who I've come up with. Everyone's amazing in their own right. But he's one of the few people who I think has transcended that UK hip hop sound. And you could play his stuff next to contemporary like drill or grime artists or like trap musicians. And it would work alongside it. Obviously, he's maybe a bit older and come with a maturity and wisdom and reflectiveness in his lyrics and a certain amount of wordplay that maybe differs to some of the wordplay that you see in Drill, for instance. But it, it fits comfortably alongside it. And I don't think, no disrespect intended to anyone, there's many artists from our scene that have made that journey that he has. And, you know, he's a constant inspiration for me um, just in terms of his work ethic. Again, he's a multi-hyphener, a polymath, does all his own artwork, does all his own videos. He does a lot of good work as well within the community, supporting young, you know, young people, artists and creators. And this Dave actually, he was saying to me, I never, I never, I, again, it's one of the things that I'd forgotten. He was telling me that the first show he ever did, um, and I'm not sure if it's the first show he ever did, or it's the first show outside of London, but it was me that brought him on stage. It was a show we did in Cambridge, and I think, I'm pretty sure, but don't call me. I need to double check. I have to give him a shout. It was a show Riz Ahmed booked me for, who obviously again has gone on to incredible things. You know, big up Riz Ahmed, really proud of him as well. Um, really happy to see his journey. Um, last connected with him just before his uh, appearance in Star Wars. So like, I was mad. He's gone from being like a UK rapper to being like, you know, winning Emmys and being in Star Wars and um, uh, obviously the Venom film as well. So yeah, really happy for his success. So yeah, I think, yeah, I brought Genesis Elijah out at a show that I was booked for by Riz Ahmed. <laughs> Although I'm just going to, sorry, I know I'm talking a lot. My other mad show in Cambridge, I've done quite a few mad shows in Cambridge. There's one where we sort of started the mini riot uh, when I did Party Annals, which is a song obviously with Doc Brown, who again has gone on to achieve incredible things in the world of comedy and acting. Um, there's a show I did at Cambridge University Summer Ball. With <laughs> And I've referenced this in the song I recorded recently, is me, foreign beggars, 
Brian Harvey from E17 and Jimmy Carl all on the same lineup <laughs> with an uh, ice sculpture as well, man. So yeah, we got mad stories for days on that front, bro. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, but back to the question about the three albums in one year. Yeah, I mean, I work way in advance. So I mean, that was all lined up months before the first release. Like I said, bro, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an independent artist. I'm doing this myself. So you, you just have to be so prepared to enable, you know, put the, the domino in place so that you can just hit one and knock them down so that the, you know, the, the trick goes running. So, yeah, um, I'm not going to lie, bro. I'm, I'm happy to be having, like, not releasing anything for the next few weeks or months now. So it's been, it's been the Christmas period has been good in that. I've got, had time to do a lot of admin, which again is the unglamorous side of being an independent artist that people don't necessarily see. And, um, just writing, recording, mixing a lot of new songs and um, yeah, even just the other day, you know, we were in the studio, I had like eight people in the studio, which again, it's so different to the classic UK hip hop days. That, that would have been something that would have happened then. Like, I've not experienced anything since the early periods. So that was just amazing. We were recording the tune where we, and the course is in Spanish. I had all these different uh, people speaking Spanish on the track. Even this one girl, she never even, she's, she's like a, she's, I think she's doing like a PhD at the moment, actually. And like she's like, a, she works in medicine or something. And it's the first time ever in the studio. She's a Colombian girl. And she like, had to speak and I was writing her parts and then she was translating it into Spanish. So like, I was just incredible energy, man. So um, yeah, that's what drives me. That's what sustains me. And um, that's what I enjoy. So yeah, lots more music on its way. Can't that's wait dope, to share man. it. That's yeah, dope. yeah. So, so in terms of, in terms of, in terms of your artistry, man, and how you've evolved, mm. obviously from your your first stint in the scene, obviously um, things have changed in terms of that. Like, you know how how it's things sure, like sure. Um, religion and fatherhood affected how you, you you approach your music these days. I think what I've always tried to be is authentic and true to myself, and just use the art as a vehicle for expressing my own ideas and thoughts. It's funny because often people ask you, what's your biggest inspiration? And, you know, to quote Snoop Dogg myself. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just draw on my own life experiences and, you know, my own reflections upon the world and put them into my art. But I try and do it in a way where it isn't laboured holier than thou, preaching at people, getting on pedestal, virtue signaling. I want it to be fun for people. I want it to be soulful, meditative, enjoyable, and put something positive out there that could uplift people's spirits and maybe make them think. I think Tupac said how he wasn't going to be the progenitor of the revolution, but maybe his music would inspire a kid that starts a revolution. I'm thinking of a quote from Poe Dameron in Rise of Skywalker says, we will be the spark that ignites the flame that burns down the, the first order or something like that. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my whole ethos with it, man. Like, I just want to put something positive out there. But it's interesting as well, because you know, I was just having this discussion yesterday. So AJ Tracy, uh, you know, I've been privy to his come up as someone who lives in Labrick Grove. Um, you know, I've, uh, he's someone who's in the queen. I'm not going to be like, you know, name dropping, like he's like my best friend. But yeah, you know, I know him. I know his family and stuff. Live next door to some of his family members. Um, so I've seen this come up. And obviously, and this is not me critiquing or anything like that. Um, now, his music isn't necessarily like overtly conscious, although, you know, like, you know, his, uh, love me a little more. He's referenced Che Guevara, which I love. Uh, I loved it a little more. <laughs> uh, he had his little belly references in the video. So, which again, it's just like seeing that video, like this is just so beyond what we <laughs> you could do when we start that UK hip hop. Mm -hmm. But he's someone that does so much for the community. You know, I mean, so it's fascinating to see, you know, people could have a, you know, commentary on what someone's doing as a, you never truly, truly know what is going on with a person, their intent, who they are, how they conduct themselves, how they are with their family members, with their community you know he paid for a massive digital black lives matter billboard at the roundabout in shepherd's bush so mm -hmm. if any of the people watching if you're ever driving to westfield 
look at Shepherd's Bush roundabout. There's a huge Black Lives Matter billboard that's been there for the past year and a half now. Actually. He's paying for that. Again, people wow. wouldn't necessarily know that. Do you know? Do you know what's this actually? Week, uh, do you know what's actually quite funny? You you mentioned that I actually mm. saw that for the first time today. You know, no. um, bro, look today, at the day, man. Bro, bro. You, you know, because because um, it's split in two, isn't it? So the top half's white and black, and the bottom half yep. black and white. Exactly. Yeah, and I saw that, and I was just like, oh. that's interesting. You know, and it's just wow, bro, it's crazy. You mentioned isn't that. that deep. <laughs> bro, but there you go. I, and I was at first, I was thinking, oh, do I mention this because I don't want it to come across like I'm name dropping or, you know what I mean? But I was thought, no, it's important. Mm. Well, no, like as an artist, there's just so much more going on behind the scenes. You never truly know what people are going through and the struggles they may be having or the good works that they're doing that may go unnoticed. So, also, another thing that he does every year is a like a Christmas drive I guess you could say in terms of supporting the families the community locally so paying for like turkey Christmas trees hamper baskets this sort of stuff um so yeah that was done on last week um again so just behind the scenes work, like soup kitchens all this sort of stuff supporting different institutions uh locally so yeah it's just it's deep bro you know so i just try to be the same person in my music as i am behind the scenes and it's deep bro um fusion who again is someone that does so much work in terms of the world of education mentoring supporting young people um and he said to me he's like bro he's like you don't realize it you know you're you're like you're maybe you, you not belittling it but you know, in this industry, there's a lot of people that pretend to be something they're not. You've always mm-hmm. been yourself. I was like, oh, bro, I'm not really thought about it that much. You know, I mean, he said it yeah. to me outside the chip shop once, you know, the, the legendary venue in Brixton. Mm-hmm. So with my archery, yeah, I just try and put myself into my music. And obviously, there's a certain amount of uh, entertainment there. Yeah. At times, you may use a little bit of artistic license if you're not literally you know, writing a thesis or a biography, but... Yeah, I try to be the same person as I am behind the scenes as I am on the track. Um, there we go. That's dope, man. And and I, you know, our final question usually is the the legacy question, which I which I believe you've already answered in part. Mm. But I'll, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll sure, see if sure. any more comes out when I ask it. Um, what would you say is the the, the Tommy Evans legacy? Ooh, that's a fantastic question. I think maybe we have addressed it to a degree already and that I do try and give back. I always have tried to conduct myself as a creative and as a professional artist with integrity, with sound ethics in terms of supporting others, providing that encouragement and not just like say words because it can be so easy and at times it can be self-serving. People are thinking if I'm nice to that person then I'll get something in return. So hopefully just in terms of the people I've brought through so, like I said, you know, like having Genesis remind me, oh, you, you brought me up for my first gig or Mike Assassin saying very kind words about me, you know, he's been interviewed by Ty or, you know, um, I think one of Essa, aka Young Gun, you know, one of the, some of his earliest appearances are on my record, Silent Mobius, Four Horsemen. I mean, again, just seeing his journey as like an incredible rapper and son who, Again, for me, he's one of my all-time favorite UK hip hop artists as well. And I always wish he'd blown up even bit. I think if he'd been, you know, the 22-year-old young gun from that era, if he'd transplanted him now, I think he'd be a huge pop star. But I really, would. it's just because that infrastructure wasn't there in that time period. But he had that mind state of he saw something beyond just doing rapidly rap, and he had very well-crafted hooks, choruses, and you know, he could look in stylish sense of humor can laugh at himself tunes that could appeal to different demographics positive so again you know just and like i said I, that takes nothing away from his work ethic his dedication professionalism but you know, i tried to help him a little bit on his journey um and you know fast forwarding now the singers i work with rappers i work with there's a few you know um artists that i've got on forthcoming project a few more rappers actually. i'm working with a few more rappers there's been a lot of singers over the past couple of years bring a few more rappers so for me I, th- I suppose I hope I would put that first even before my own material bro like when I think about it like in terms of giving back uh, 
if that's what we mean by legacy. Because you could do it in a vainglorious way and say, well, you know, I've done X amount of albums, had this, you know, I've been on 70 plus releases. Uh, I, was, I was updating my Spotify profile. I was just going for it. Like, yeah, like you know, since my comeback, I've put out 30 releases independently. So, yeah, I guess you could say that's an accomplishment. Um, and again, just in terms of some of the artists I've worked with, again, I think from the era of music I'm from, I do think it is not necessarily unprecedented, but it wasn't common for British hip hop, UK hip hop rappers to be working with some of the creators that I've worked with. So like I said, back in the day, Nana Cherry, Martin the Top Big Bird, Stereo MCs, I recorded with them. Nightmares on Wax, who from literally they're from like two streets away from me and like these, like I was literally looking at uh, DJ Easy's old house <laughs> uh, this morning, man. You know what I mean? So having the vision to see something beyond rap and bars and lyrics and, you know, construct well-crafted songs. But for me, I, I, you know, the architecture of a track is what intrigues me. So I see rap as part of the football team. So it's not necessarily the Messi or Ronaldo or the Mbappe where it's the star player. It's more like, the, for me now at this stage of my career, it's more the Xavi or the uh, Iniesta I like my football. So it's like an integral part of the team that allows the star to flourish. So you could argue that, you know, Messi's greatest period was when he had Iniesta and Xavi behind him. Or Ronaldo's greatest period when he was in that amazing Real Madrid team. Um, so yeah, just seeing some of the people I've collaborated with then, even now, you know, like I had a tune out last year that was remixed by Prince's DJ. You know what I mean? So just these sort of things, just being able to connect with people outside of the genre, um, even, you know, like doing my acting, like getting love from like the likes of Richard E. Grant, you know, uh, Michael Sheen. Had, you know, it's just, for me, it's mad, you know what I mean? Just like just the love I've had from other artists in a way that's my legacy as well like anyone that knows me just I love creativity and they'll just always give the entirety of my being to it so hopefully that's my legacy but maybe we'll let the people do the talking like maybe when you share this you can see what people say <laughs> we'll probably put water torture and Ophelia <laughs> it's sort of like George you know George Michael becoming a more mature like you know, um, reflective eyes and people are just talking about like, wake me up before you go, go or, like have Tropicana or last Christmas. <laughs> and he's like, I'm a serious artist now. But people are remembering you for like your big, <laughs> like your iconic smashes. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, man, like, yeah, it's been, it's been an amazing journey and the journey continues. So yeah, I'm just enjoying every second of it. And Incredible. thank you for being such a, you know, a wonderful host. Thank you for indulging my lengthy monologues, my rambling, my going off on tangents, my shameless name dropping, which hopefully wasn't too <laughs> self-aggrandizing. <laughs> but anyway, I think it adds to the story. You know, when I watch Drink Champs and, you know, you hear like yeah. those stories of like DMX, <laughs> getting out to some crazy adventures or what have you. God bless DMX, rest in peace. Then yeah. that's the whole thing. Rap is essentially storytelling is, you know, uh, a poetical cool, form of sharing narrative. So, yeah, I love doing it in that way as well. <laughs> Indeed, man. Yes, that's a really very true statement, man. And, um, like, officially, man, I definitely want to thank you for your time and service so far to the to the hip-hop scene and culture. Thank you, know? you thank you. Yeah, 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 man. And also, you know, as a platform, we will always continue to support your work, you know, and definitely look Thanks forward so. to the thank new you. projects. And um, yeah, can't yeah. Wait to share, man. yeah, man. So, so officially, I'd like to thank you for joining us in this head to head. And um, yeah, we'll catch up again soon. All the best, brother. Nice one, man. Until yeah. next time. Thank you so much, bro. Peace and blessings. Big up for everyone following and Peace. supporting, man. Peace. Awesome. Abelia. Back in the day, I used to deal with her. Never thought about leaving her. Cause I was happy just to be with her